I enjoy Taylor Swift's songwriting. I like the fact that she stands up for herself in relationships and leave when things aren't okay. And I remember that her breakup songs helped me navigate my own breakups. I occasionally listen to the 10 minute version of All Too Well, despite the fact that it is a pretty explicit bullying campaign, but you knew there was a but. If you've been following me for a while, then you know that I love politics, I love activism, and I wish every celebrity was a Sinead O'Connor. In the victory of good over evil. Taylor Swift is not a Sinead O'Connor, and I'm not gonna lie, it is kind of frustrating at times. I was frustrated when she first didn't even look at Celine Dion. Who do you think you are, seriously? Like, this is Celine. There's not one single karaoke night that doesn't play Celine in France. Jokes aside, she didn't say a word about what's going on in the Middle East, she didn't say anything about the deepfake situation she was caught up in, and even though I knew it was very likely that she wouldn't say anything, it was still very frustrating to me because I knew how powerful her voice is, and I knew that she would probably stand on the right side of history. So why don't you speak up? Why did you choose to promote your album in such a parasocial way instead? Ipsos estimated that 44% of Americans are somewhat fans of Taylor Swift. She has 279 million followers on Instagram, she was Time's 2023 Person of the Year, and the era's tour sold more than 4.35 million tickets. So this woman has a lot of power. She has so much power that she changes the law. She caused the Ticketmaster disaster. Ticketmaster is a company that is the exclusive ticket seller for 80% of the top performance venues in the US. That is called a monopoly, which led to a Senate airing, an apology from Ticketmaster and an investigation. More recently, Taylor Swift was targeted by a deepfake video that circulated on Twitter and was viewed more than 47 million times. US politicians, including the White House, said that they were outraged by the situation and now representatives in the US, in the UK and Europe are close to finally take the issue seriously and legislate on that matter. In fact, the reason why I'm making this video is that I was contacted by an NGO called Control AI, which is fighting to spread awareness on deepfake videos, deepfakes in general, and promote a piece of legislation that would regulate that industry. So I was in touch with Alice, who explained that the Taylor Swift situation sped up the process of spreading awareness and that they now need to use that momentum to pass the law. Deepfakes are non-consensual, AI-generated voices, images or videos that are created to produce sexual imagery, commit fraud or spread misinformation. The vast majority of deepfakes, at least 96%, are sexual material. Pretty much all the rest is used to commit fraud, a practice that has rose by 3,000% globally in 2023 alone. Essentially anyone can become a victim of deepfakes, but women are disproportionately targeted by it. I mean, all it takes is one single photo to create a video or a 10 second audio clip to create audio content. Now this is when control AI comes in. They demand that governments impose obligations throughout the supply chain to stop the creation and spread of deepfakes. You see, the supply chain starts small. A few companies supply the AI systems to create the deepfakes and ends up large because billions of people can create deepfakes using those AI systems. So the only reliable and effective countermeasure is to hold the whole supply chain uh, responsible for deepfake creation and proliferation. That means three things. First, make the creation and dissemination of deepfakes a crime. Second, hold AI developers liable. And third, hold AI deployers liable. Deepfakes must be banned and governments must act. Now you'll find more information in the description down below. Now full disclosure, I really support what Control AI does, but I have to tell you that they do pay me for this. It's a sponsorship, but I'll give all the money to a charity. Um, you'll find more um, about that in the description box. So let's go back to Taylor Swift. We were saying that because of her influence, she has the power to change the law. The Democratic Party in the US is also absolutely crazy about her. They want her endorsement at all costs, which also made the conservatives go crazy and come up with a bunch of conspiracy theories. In her documentary, Americana, Taylor showed her difficulty to position herself on political issues. Coming from a music genre, country music, commonly associated with conservatism, endorsing Democratic candidates brought some backlash. And 
I guess that having to position herself on the Biden's presidency is also kind of tricky because if she does so, it would amount for a lot of people, myself included, to you know, endorsing Biden's complicity in what is going on in the Middle East. And complicity is a euphemism there. It would be tempting to say, oh, poor woman, so much weight on her shoulders. She's not a politician. And I get that. But isn't it a bit hypocritical? The 21st century celebrity. Now, singers have always said things like, this album is so me, I'm really getting honest here for every new album they release. But the depth of their parasocial relationship with fans has reached new levels since the beginning of the 21st century, especially in the last decade with social media. Taylor is a perfect example of that. She always mentions her fans, she has built a strong connection with them. The most dedicated Swifties will buy all the albums and merch she puts out. They'll get tickets to see her boyfriend Kelsey play and potentially see Swift watch the game as well. Now, choosing to enhance that parasocial relationship like Taylor does has consequences. You can't pick and choose what you share with your audience. If you've made the decision to use relatability as a marketing tool, then you gotta be open about your opinions, your values as well, because that is also part of friendship. I feel like it's important to establish that because a lot of the discourse around celebrities and politics too often revolve around the Kantian's view that one should never treat someone merely as a means. This idea that a celebrity shouldn't be seen as a medium for a message because they are individuals with emotions and should have a right to just do their art. In fact, when I told some of my friends who are fans of Taylor Swift that I was gonna make a video on her, the thing that came back all the time was, oh yeah, I love her songwriting, blah, 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 but. There was always a but. So a desire to separate the art from the politics. That's why Taylor's managers didn't want her to endorse that democratic candidate as we saw in the documentary. They wanted her to avoid doing any form of mission creep, meaning the expansion of an enterprise beyond its original goals. They wanted her to stay the nice, respectable girl she had always been. A nice girl doesn't force their opinions on people. Beyonce once said that becoming famous turned her into the property of the public. In fact, singer Sinead O'Connor said something very similar to Beyonce. She claimed that fame meant that she was transformed from a person to a product. But the two women did not mean the same thing. On the one hand, Beyoncé complained, like many celebrities do, that the depersonalization she experiences is caused by the public and their expectations as consumers of her content. But Sinead, on the other hand, didn't put the blame on the public. When she said that she was uh, transformed from a person to a product, she shed light on how the music industry was taking advantage of her. In a 2021 interview with The Guardian, she responded to the Pope controversy with this. But it was not derailing, people say. Oh, you fucked up your career. But they're talking about the career they had in mind for me. I fucked up the house in Antigua that the record company dudes wanted to buy. I fucked up their career, not mine. Sinead reclaimed her subjectivity there by redefining what authenticity means in the music industry. For her, being authentic doesn't mean seeking relatability at all costs. Her vision of authenticity is counterproductive. It doesn't lead to more sales, quite the contrary. But getting political wasn't a choice for her. It was aligned with the nature of her art, a personal form of art. The music industry pushes artists to expand their parasocial relationship with fans in a way that definitely turns them into a product. But a product to whom fans are just responding to the signals given to them. If a celebrity gets personal, then yes, they feel like they have permission to engage in that sort of relationship with them. He gives me a ring, I'm like, no. He gives me flowers, I'm like, no. And then he gives me a kitten, and I'm like, yes, absolutely, you know me clearly. Sometimes people don't know that Taylor has actually three cats. Okay. Does it go too far sometimes? Yeah, sure, I won't deny that. But ultimately, those who truly benefit from that aren't the fans, not the celebrities, because it's psychologically costly to do that. No, the ones who truly win at that game are the labels, the big capitalist labels. Celebrities like any individual deserve a right to privacy, that's fair, but so much of the discourse is centered on the fans and how much people hate fandoms instead of looking at the managers, the music labels who extract so much money from all this drama. The celebrity and 21st century activism. 
I've always been amazed at how fans can move mountains for their cars, their celebrity. When deepfake videos of Taylor Swift circulated online, Swifties immediately flooded Twitter with fan videos to make sure that when people were looking for the deepfakes, when they were searching for Taylor Swift, they couldn't find anything but fan videos. During the BLM protests, K-pop fans mobilized in support of the movement. They also took over Twitter hashtags used by opponents with fan videos and did the same thing to prevent the Dallas police uh, from soliciting videos of BLM protests from the public. As Archer and C wrote, quote, here a fandom community that is built on a shared love of a particular kind of music developed a sufficiently strong moral identity to serve as the basis for political activism with shared political goals. End of the quote. What's clear here is that the better the cause is defined, the better the activism is. Fighting to protect Taylor Swift is an extremely clear cause, and because fans are deeply attached to Taylor Swift, they are convinced that that cause is morally good. Now, fighting against capitalism, patriarchy, climate change, or imperialism is not as clear. That's why a lot of people give up before even trying. I mean, the immensity and complexity of those problems we face as a society make it impossible to imagine how, as an individual, we can change anything. That's the Camusian way of looking at things. Camus showed that as you learn about the world and its injustices, so as you become more and more woke, let's say, things appear more and more absurd. Why are we still doing business as usual when the planet is burning? Why do we clock in and out of the office every day to fulfill a bullshit job? Why are we talking about how the war is affecting the economy when thousands of kids are dying? It's absurd. It's completely absurd. But what can you as an individual do about it? Very little, it seems. In that context, activism sometimes feels like the eternal struggle of Sisyphus, you know, the Greek king who was condemned to roll a boulder up a hill only for it to roll back down as he almost reached the top. The fight seems absurd from the outside. That's why activists are often uh, asked with a patronizing smile, how do you motivate yourself? Are you crazy? Or you're young, go into your life before it's too late. That recognition of the absurdity of the world and our resulting powerlessness is difficult to live with. It can turn into resentment towards those who have power, celebrities, people who through personal success have earned their freedom while we contemplate a life of insignificance, it seems. It is easier to call out a celebrity or an influencer than it is to make a plan um, about how to abolish capitalism. You know, why didn't she talk about this? Why didn't he take a stance on that? And you, what do you do? And I'm not saying that in what's your excuse type of way. I'm just wondering if you're not displacing your agency, your subjectivity onto someone else, the celebrity, because you feel like your life and actions are meaningless. But by doing that, you give them even more power, more agency, and increasingly lose yours. Can you explain that life is meaningless and absurd? But another existentialist, I mean, Demi refused to be called an existentialist, but it kind of fits into that box, to be honest. Philosopher drama there. So another existentialist, Simone de Beauvoir, insisted that meaninglessness shouldn't lead us to give away our subjectivity to others. Sure, you are likely to be operating in a system that seeks your submission at work, um, in the household, but you're never 100% object or 100% subject. You're always a mix of the two. That means that when there is no meaning in life, one has to create it, and the best way to do that is to do it with others. Actually, when I was researching for this video, I went on YouTube to find a video and saw this on my homepage. I've been watching Casey Neistat for a very long time. I love his creativity, his style, and I'm jealous of his collection of boards. But what drew my attention this time was the title of the video, Sisyphus. I clicked on it and watched the whole thing and I smiled at the end because I was like, yes, this is a perfect example for what I'm trying to convey in my video. Basically, for those of you who don't know who Casey Neistat is, he started doing YouTube before it even existed, he lives in New York and got popular with his vlogs. Now, Casey is also very sporty and in that Sisyphus video, he explained how he set up this goal of doing a marathon under three hours. He failed multiple times, a lot of times actually. It felt like he was pushing that boulder up the hill but could never get to the top. But one day, after a long break, he changed his strategy. He hired a coach and guess what? He got amazing results and ended up completing a marathon in two hours and 57 minutes. Good job, Casey, and good job, coach. 
for me, the moral of that story is that things work out so much better when uh, we work together towards the same goal. It creates meaning not only for yourself, but also the people around you who were involved. And those connections made at a specific time in a specific place create a story that can then become history. And I know we're fed with self-help stories and to be fair, Casey didn't emphasize too much the fact that he had a coach. He made sure that he was still the main character of that story, but still he mentioned it a few times so that people like me can pick up on that. He showed the failures, he showed the training, so he showed the process, which is good because that's how you demystify impossible dreams. In fact, when you look at the way social movements are talked about in the media, in history classes, we very much focus on one specific element, so a speech, a person, a specific protest, or two, we'll look at those movements through waves. So the first wave, second wave, third wave feminism. Now this approach of social movements is flawed because it implies that there are good moments to be an activist and less good moments. It fails to show the continuous work that activism requires. As an example, in black studies, scholars are now often opting for a long movement approach. Maybe you've heard that phrase already, the long civil rights movement. Well, they did so because they wanted to show three things. First, that the civil rights movement was a series of local struggles rather than a national movement. So that's the locality element. Second, that the movement transcended the historical period of 1955 to 1975. So that's the historicity element. And three, that it was continuous. It wasn't limited to specific events. We can apply that theory to a lot of social movements and to activism in general, to be fair. Doing so helps individuals figure out what role they can play in the movement at any time. When you look at the way Swifties operate, you have a model for effective activism. Most active Swifties regularly share fan videos online. They follow fan accounts, build their communities, and stay in touch with what is going on. So when something bad happens, they are ready to act in an organized and effective way. As journalist Vincent Bevins explained in If We Burn, the most effective protests of the 2010s were also the most organized. The shadow work of keeping your structure working and improving that structure by making sure that you have diversity, that the people take care of their mental health, um, that members are kept accountable, is key for success. On the other hand, waiting for the right moment or relying on specific charismatic people to uphold the cause, so influencers, celebrities, or hot activists, can work short term, but won't necessarily work long term. So yeah, I think that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed this very philosophical, but very action-oriented video. As always, the conversation continues in the comments section. Thank you to Control AI for the work they do. You can find out more about them in the description. Thank you to my patrons for their support and a special thank to top tier patrons, Brandon, James, Ujwal, Pablo, Patrick, Boris, Ria, Ivan, Remy, Toki, Corrigi, Tristan, Patricia, Lenny, Jan, Donage, Alex, Ren, Manuel, Perry, and the other ones who prefer to stay anonymous. And yeah, I'll see you very soon. Salut!